focus and connection. And that's where we start, in the zone of silence. What's the zone of silence? Well, um, you know about the zone of silence. No, I don't actually. You don't? I saw it on your, on your CV. I thought, what is the zone of silence? Well, it's Perry Schneiderman who brought this back to us. It's Perry's fault. Okay. Yeah. Right. Perry Schneiderman was the great exponent of the zone of silence. I think it must have come from Lecoq. And it's one of Perry's things. Describe it. Well, uh, I had to ask Perry that when I first came to teach at, at George Brown in 1986. And Perry sat down and talked to me for some while. I took copious notes. And then I just began to do it. And I've now been doing it for uh, a quarter of a century. I suppose I'm, since Perry stopped doing it, which he did a few years ago, I'm probably the one of the principal exponents of it in the country. And? Well, you work in complete silence. It's in an improvisational exercise, working in complete silence. You set up a little area. You call it something, because we can't work in vagaries. You have to work in specifics. It's a you put a few magazines down and you ask them what it looks like, the chances are they'll say that looks like a doctor's office or a dentist's office. It looks like a waiting room. Good. Fine. It's a waiting room. And then um, I send them up in small groups, three usually to begin with, and I say, there it is. It's a doctor's office. You have two things you have to focus on. One is to be there entirely in that space, in that moment. You are there in the doctor's office. What are you doing? Waiting. You are waiting in a doctor's office. That's the first thing. Can you be completely with every fiber of your being in that office waiting. And the second thing is you are at all times keenly aware of the other people in that office waiting with you. So it begins at absolute zero. That is the exercise. I begin with a quick round of that, just so that everybody in the class can get a taste of it. And then we talk about it. What, what did this feel like? What, what do you think is going on here? What was your experience trying to do this? And then we get all kinds of feedback. And then we go, I bet, do it again and again and again for days, for weeks. It's a kind of meditation. It's a kind of that. But, there are but the if it's hard enough to be completely in the moment yes, in your own life, yes, I know. how then do you be completely in the moment in a created life? You study to be. You learn to be. You focus on becoming that. And after a certain length of time, you give them a little twist. Goose it a little, as Perry says. You're waiting in the doctor's office. They've been doing this for some time now. And by the way, I've sent them out on uh, an autocour. I've said, I break them up in groups. I say, go out, do one of these somewhere. Choose a locale, do one, and do it two or three times, three or four times if you can. Let the same things happen each time but also be aware of other things that might happen and then bring it into the class and see what happens there. Now, how is this not naturalism? Well, it's not any ism at all. It's just focusing, it's training to focus on being in a place and to focus on being 
and interacting in various ways with other people. Just the fact that you're not alone makes a difference. But to observe that then, I am observing naturalism. I'm, I'm being the devil's advocate here. Fine, yeah. It, so naturalism does work at times. It begins somewhere, but I'm not interested in what's natural. I'm interested in what's truthful. But in that situation, both are Maybe, lined up. if you like. But then we throw in something else. You're, you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting, and gradually as you wait and the time goes on and on and on, you are aware of some something bothering you, something on your mind, something of a physical nature, something inside you, something maybe on the surface of your body, a maladjustment of clothing, maybe something atmospheric, that as you wait and wait and wait grows and grows and grows and becomes more and more, taking over your consciousness. And meanwhile, all the other things. And as they get used to this madness, because it is utterly bewildering to them for the first few weeks, and that's okay, <laughs> they begin really to without knowing it, without realizing it, they begin to exercise all of the things that they're going to need as actors. And then, ultimately, you give them something uh, of a different nature, uh, a problem in their life that is beginning to more and more intensely trouble them. As they have to sit, they have to wait, and they have to be aware of the other people. So there's more and more going on in the room, more and more that's affecting them. And before too long, you move into different, all kinds of different locales, public spaces, public places where strangers are caught in a moment of waiting. So you're also talking about listening. Totally. It's all about the receptive skills, because there's no, no speaking going on, there's no talking going on. Because if you start improvising with speech, it shoots you straight up into your head, which is not where acting comes from. It's entirely from the gut. And so you learn to go deeper and deeper into that gut. And as we get into more and more loaded locales, it just calls forth more and more stuff from people. And it gets very scary for some people because they're suddenly naked up there with something really emotional hitting them, just at the moment when they least expect it sometimes. And all this is going on while they're, they're deepening their understanding of their physicality, of their voice in voice class, of their movement. All of these things are happening at the same time, and it's all beginning to come together imperceptibly. And when they least expect it, but stuff begins to happen quite spontaneously that you would pay big bucks to see in a theater. Mm -hmm. And it's not performance. It's people actually interacting, receiving, and giving totally spontaneously and without brain work. Some of my most difficult students have been what we call brainiacs. They're so attached to their intelligence that they want to analyze everything and watch themselves doing. And they have a great deal of difficulty breaking through that. 